hey there fellow survivor and welcome back to another episode of hammer d20 the show that looks sometimes has difficulty putting a good book down my name is steven sobot and i will be your guide today we're going to focus on novels films and the unholy marriage between these two warring factions you see many films that have come out recently are adaptations of stories and novels and comics that have already existed uh, the films V for Vendetta and Watchmen are adapted from graphic novels made by the graphic novelist Alan Moore. And as some of you know, Marvel and DC films that have come out recently are all adapted from some comic book storyline, give or take some liberties. I say some liberties because a film only has about an hour and a half to three hours to tell you its whole story, Whereas a comic book storyline could extend for 50, 100, 200 issues, ignoring the other comic book stories that you have to go through to kind of get the full picture. And thus, for millennia, these two giants of medium have been fighting for supremacy, over which is a superior product. Print, although a slower and more arduous task to consume, provides its reader with a detailed world that allows it to open its own imagination to something that one can only begin to fathom. And film, a much easier to digest medium that allows itself to merge together audio and visual elements, though requires larger budgets and more talent, more cast, more people involved to make it come to fruition or even get anywhere close to the imagination, that a book or a comic is able to obtain. Which of these will win, will reign supreme over the other? Well, it's obviously films, because if you look at the charts, you'll see that books really don't make anywhere close to the same money films do. But that, that being said, books are a gateway to something that's greater than a lot of other things. And so I spoke to Stephen Hayes, the writer and author of the book, When the Luck Runs Dry, a novelization of a film that he had made in 2012 named Lucky Seven. So I asked him about the writing process, what the book's about, and why he adapted that movie into a novel. Stephen, let's go give Stephen a call. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. So Stephen, what exactly is When the Luck Runs Dry? Oh, it's uh, a novel. I just uh, finished writing, I guess, last... Uh last spring, kind of around the time the pandemic was in full swing okay. and uh, spent the last uh, eight or nine months uh, working on the process of getting it copy edited and uh, finding a cover artist and a typesetter and a print house and uh, looking around for publishers, et cetera. And I uh, just published uh, on um, some e-platforms about two weeks ago and I just uh, did a print run and just finished uh, getting them from the printer about one week ago of a new novel. And it's uh, kind of in a hard boiled kind of pulp fiction, first person narration style, but it's all um, based in Hamilton, mm. set in Hamilton in sort of like time frame of the late 1990s. And it's also based on a original script that became a film from uh, about eight, nine years ago. So it's all kind of connected together. Yeah. I, as, and uh, you mentioned in your press release that it was, a, it's like a neo noir, but I guess it would be better from the, the author itself. I guess, uh, what is the novel about really? Uh, it's about somebody that uh, has left town for quite a number of years, mm. eight, eight, nine years, mm. uh, because there's a history uh, with his father uh, with the uh, organized crime, you know, it's set in Hamilton and it's set in the nineties and yeah. there is a history of organized crime in Hamilton and some events that happened when I had moved to Hamilton in the nineties uh, with uh, a certain mobster getting killed and some other ramifications. And it kind of gave me an idea of like kind of using that in order the setting of Hamilton as a template uh, for uh sort of a crime story, but it's really a redemption story, the hero's journey, somebody trying to come back and fix something for somebody else. But when he comes back, lots of other things have changed. He's like a fish out of water. He's lost his connection with home. He's lost his connection with his family and friends. And he's lost his insight on what's kind of going on. And uh, some events happen. There's a murder and he ends up 
being kind of cast as the murderer, even though he's not. So uh, he decides, so he's not a detective to kind of uh, try to figure out what the heck's going on, which causes a lot of uh, ramifications for himself and his family and people kind of in his uh, sort of sphere of influence. As you said, he's a detective, but then he kind of has to be vigilante to try to get his, get the truth, you know? And, that, that. and, that, and that's uh, the cover, right? So you've got um, Stelco and we actually shot a scene for the film and he's going to pay back this money for his father. Mm. Um, but when this meeting was arranged, he goes to meet this older mob figure, but someone has basically just killed him and he's kind of left there as sort of the suspect, but oh, he gets away. Yeah. But, but he's <laughs> suspect number one, basically. Then right? he starts his own investigation, right? Mm. So gotcha. Um, okay, yeah. And, and, and so, in terms of the events of the film, uh, it was right. The the film's name, Lucky Seven, right? Yeah, the film's yeah. name, Lucky Seven. But the book uh, we switched, uh, or I switched the title to something a little based on a saying: "When the luck runs dry, and then you make your own." And that's sort of based in pulp fiction, uh, hard-boiled detective storytelling. A lot of times, is it's usually a detective or a, yeah. or a policeman, but uh, they normally something happens and they should just walk away, but they just keep won't stop, and all this stuff happens. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and bodies pile up usually in most cases, but uh, they they <laughs> yeah. just keep going. They want to get to the 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 truth. Uh, whatever that may be, but the truth usually turns out to be elusive. Yeah, it's too much. It's never it, for in a lot of times. Like I would have, you know, I can't speak for your for your novel. I guess a lot of times it's not gonna be a really happy ending. You know, he doesn't just go out and marry the princess and everyone's good and the people justice completely comes to fruition. So he kind um, of he kind of may, but it's yeah, bittersweet. yeah, yeah, sweet, yeah, bittersweet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> you have to wait for the sequel. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So that's uh, another thing that you mentioned. Um, you are currently working on the sequel, correct? Right. Because uh, this book, uh, I always tell my your audience that I yeah. never actually wrote, uh, did novel writing. I wrote scripts. I worked in film production from like 1982 till, well, I had an accident in 2013. And that was the end of my <laughs> uh, work as, you know, in the film production uh, side of things in Toronto, mostly. Mm. Uh, so I had written a couple scripts. One I um, directed as a film in 20, uh, 2011, Lucky Seven. Mm. Uh, at the time, I wrote a sequel. Oh, uh, I see. Okay, okay. A continuation of this this story mm. called Fallen Angels. Is the name of that. From the film to the novel, is there much? Is like, What kind of differs? It's backwards. Mm. Like I think we were talking before we started this interview uh, for folks at home about how normally uh, someone writes a book or maybe a graphic novel and a producer sees it and goes, oh, I'm going to option that and try and get a script writer and see if we can film this. Uh, whereas this is backwards, like it's uh, where you're taking a, a movie and turning or a movie script and turning it into a book. But uh, I guess the issue is that you have the story, but you don't have to be inside the box of the script. Mm. And sometimes, especially when I wrote my first script and I knew I was going to produce it and I was going to be independent and I would have a low budget that you make certain choices sometimes like in a crime, two hour crime movie, there's only one gunshot on camera. Mm. But when you think about if I'm writing it or even if you're doing a comic book version, you can have a, a hundred thousand gunshots. It doesn't cost you anything. Uh, but when you're thinking of, you know, when we shot our film, we did one gunshot and mm -hmm. that cost about $800 to do that shot that's on camera uh, for 10 seconds. Uh, so that's a budgetary decision. But when you're writing, converting to book, you have to get outside of that mindset that, oh, I, I don't have to be, I don't put those limits on myself, mm -hmm. right? If I want a, a fleet of, flying saucers to descend from the sky i can do that because it uh, doesn't it doesn't cost me anything but when you're writing for an independent film script mm. and you're thinking of producing it those are considerations uh, of your story yeah I was, I was just thinking i was like <laughs> yeah so if you, you know dinosaurs came on and i read the novel I'm like okay i'm real oh the the, the movies when's the dinosaurs but anyway <laughs> obviously exactly. as, as you just said right for i guess for for this uh um when did you guys start the whole novel process uh, I guess um, 
Moy, we talked about me kind of getting knocked knocked out of the, you know, working in production in 2013. I I'd finished the film in like 2011. Uh, we we went to uh, we got into like a festival in well we screened in Hamilton mm-hmm. and we screened in Luzerne, Switzerland, and in, in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. And we got into a really uh, big festival, second biggest film festival in Asia, the Shanghai International. Okay. Out of t- ten Canadian films, we we scooped in there with with our unknown, unfun- unfunded, independent <laughs> shot in Hamilton thing. Yeah. Uh, then we went to Berlin in 2013 to the European Film Market, and uh, I did a lot of research there and was in the process of basically finding a, a distributor when I had an accident, and mm-hmm. then that was sort of knocked me out for one to two years. So um, the book process started. You know, probably after that, and uh, I did actually. I went back to wrote three scripts. I uh, did a lot of blogging. I went to Europe and went to some festivals and did a lot of blogging. Um, built that presence up, and then uh, um, two or three scripts: a zombie Viking script and a, a post-apocalyptic script um, set in a nuclear bunker. Mm. Um, but uh, well, I've been in Montreal part time for a couple of years, and I took a writing course at the Writers Federation here, and that was the first time I'd ever taken a writing course ever, and like about writing a novel. Mm. And uh, then I was like, oh, I'll just start, and I started, and then the pandemic sort of came in, and I just like, I'll just keep working on it, and uh, yeah. got my first draft in, and uh, yeah, it's it's nice, it, it's it's uh, it's different. Then I'm doing a movie. It's much more difficult as a writer, but uh, as uh, trying to get a finished uh, product, like product or artwork or whatever you want to call it, you know, mm-hmm. is so much easier and cheaper mm-hmm. because the amount of people involved is so much smaller and uh i guess for the uh for this specific story what what would you say is kind of something like your inspiration or something that you kind of saw that you're like oh that's like that's like really gave you some juice to it oh this story yeah. well i i uh i love like anything to do with uh pulp fiction film noir films uh that in that kind of style of writing and that style of character so when i even when i wrote the original script it, it, the characters all spoke like it was sort of like 1940 not quite but mm-hmm. you know uh there's a movie called brick that you can find it was out quite a few years ago where it's set in a high school in california in like 1990s but everyone talks like it's 1942 oh you know it's very bizarre oh. that was sort of like the inspiration and then being in hamilton and going this is like this heaven and hell. Like you mm-hmm. have the beauty and then the, the grit and, and you've got the organized crime. You got all these amazing stories and my heritage is Irish and Italian. And this was like, and then knowing not to slag Canada, but I'm going to slightly slag it. Sure. It's like when you read about some of these stories of this, this Johnny Papalia guy and, the, Mus- the Musitanos and all the and this, this guy was part of the friend and you read about and all these other things and you go wow if this these people were in the United States they would have had books and movies made about them Bleh. why has no one done anything here it's just like this weird like hidden thing it, it's like it's something kind of seedy it doesn't it doesn't fit Canada's identity ah oh, seediness that doesn't happen in Canada no, everyone is moose and cocky and whatnot ha, ha, but... they, yeah it's, it's <laughs> odd like you think uh, it, like certain stories like the stories that made the French connection with Gene Hackman mm-hmm. this guy you know the character's based he did 10 years for the French connection but oh. no one's made a movie about him because he's Canadian uh before we kind of uh close off is there anything else you like want to mention yeah, well, that's uh, I'm working on the sequel. I have uh, a graphic novel uh, thing that you, you would probably be interested in called Diggers about uh, grave diggers in a small town in northern Ontario that happened to accidentally uncover an ancient Viking burial ground. Mm, one oh, of them is a one of them is a thief, though. Oh, oh and, uh, okay. the buried Viking ghosts aren't enamored of thievery, and it creates a whole bunch of stuff in this small town. Uh, that wasn't that's a film script but that is something i might turn into a graphic novel project which would be kind of like 
a build on from doing a novel would mm. be you know, adding another element to do a graphic novel that if someone were to a uh watch lucky seven and or if someone were to get a copy of when the luck runs dry how would one do so <laughs> oh lucky seven well you can go to uh, you can find it on itunes in north america with or you can go to factory films factoryfilms.com though they're my distributor in toronto and it's on itunes uh for the book it's on three e-platforms kobo kindle ibooks or apple books whatever they're called uh right now and um right now it's uh i just got the copies it's for sale in hamilton and westdale at the paisley coffee shop it should be in the james street bookseller or maybe in the next week or two okay um but their best is to go to my blog slash website, which has a funny name, but because I'm transitioning to Montreal, mm -hmm. it's called Hard Boiled Dans La Rue. Mm. So hard boiled on the street. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, Steve. Uh, back to you, Stephen. Oh, oh yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Oh, right. Uh, before we move on, uh, let's take a short break. Uh, see you soon. Welcome back. So last week we were talking about kind of what made us into a nerd. And as I did it, I spoke to my friend Kevin Campanella about why he kind of grew this fascination with comic books. Because I figured this topic kind of combines, you know, comic storylines and films. And I know he has a few fervent opinions about this exact thing. I figured I'd call him on to the show to see if he'd be willing to talk about this exact thing. Stephen, let's go call Kevin. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, so, Kevin, how's uh, how's life treating you these days? Obviously. Well, uh, you know, just trying to stay sane during lockdown and almost succeeding. <laughs> and as you know, as a fellow nerd like myself, I think we yeah. all are trying to get into some comic books or some graphic novels. So, uh, yeah. I got you know, I got you know, it's almost like a weird question. Is there anything that you're reading right now that's? Uh, uh, that's like that caught your attention. Um, right now I'm trying to actually work my way through uh, a couple gifts I got uh, over the holidays. I actually got Persepolis uh, recently. Okay, uh, I've seen it. Oh, and yes, yeah. Next up, I will be working on the Scumbag. Ooh. I've actually been trying to get into the Power Rangers by Boom Studios. Okay. I've heard. I've been hearing like a lot of good stuff from that. It feels like there's an expansion of that kind of power rangers story that idea but you know the mm. power rangers is kind of like a silly kids show and then it seems like there's this whole big slightly more mature element of exactly that it's, it's still silly but they're just like you know what we're gonna have fun with the silliness yeah. and um in itself it's like there's a lot of media and a lot of kind of graphic novels and comics and stuff like that that gets turned into a movie um and the thing that always gets interesting is how the accuracy kind of like how one transitions from one to another right like mm. a lot of sometimes it's just it's a one-to-one -one piece and sometimes it's like a complete destruction of everything i do find like yeah, sometimes like people that cry like ah this thing isn't comic accurate you're thinking to yourself like i don't even know how that would work in this like sense of the continuity it's okay that it's not the same thing but then there are other times when something like Stray is wildly off path off of uh, what the original intent was. Like, um, if I remember correctly, uh, before the Minstrel movies by Michael Bay, mm. he originally wanted them to be aliens from space. Okay. Like, two, half of the title, right out of the gate, just doesn't make sense anymore. They're not mutants or turtles they're just <laughs> aliens and uh i'm not sure if i include in the episode but you mentioned that when you were reading your comics from your uncle's collection uh that you really got into suicide squad um right and then out comes the suicide squad film and there's one person i know that's fervently <laughs> that yeah. uh yeah uh so i guess the qu I, I guess the, the the main thing is uh how does the kind of Suicide Squad movie compared to the series. As somebody that prides themselves as the Suicide Squad film expert, as I've seen it 
three times personally for no apparent reason. Um, it's hot garbage, uh, both as just an adaptation of the source material and just as a story in general. There's so many just like holes there. A lot of the character inspirations don't make sense. Mm. Uh, like I said before, like the original Suicide Squad adaptation was supposed to be like. Hey, uh, let's take these C and D list villains that don't have like any backstory to them and help flush them out and like show them off to uh, like a new generation of people. Mm. And then the movie comes out and like it it does that sort of, but it it, it does lean a lot into its Batman villains. Um, yeah, and it seemed really focused on a few key characters that. People already sort of know at this point, so it's just like, ah, it's it's not like it's a Suicide Squad movie. It's a dead shot, a Harley Quinn. Um, mm. People like know these people, which is why I'm excited for like the new movie to come out because um, uh, it's gonna have like stuff like Rack Catcher and Polka Dot Man and Savant and stuff. Yeah, uh, King Shark. I don't even know who the hell Savant is. So uh, like, cool. Let's learn about these people. I'm down. <laughs> That's really interesting that you mentioned that thing because the thoughts. That come to my mind when I remember that film uh, is the is the scene when military boy uh, Rick Flag when he was like uh, when he when like two thirds to the film they're like we're introducing another person here's Katana her sword captures the souls of the victims and it's like yeah you, you know it's like talk about backstory you're like they're there that's one mm. sentence. Look at this character. Really unnecessary backstory just so they could introduce the Soul Taker Sword for Harley Quinn to use in the finale. So, like, Katana wasn't even useful for any part of that film. Yeah. I don't even remember, like, any of the action scenes she was in. They had to make it that Harley Quinn's the main one, right? Yeah. Um, and it's just like, you know, they kind of could. Killer Croc was completely. almost had no room to do anything. He, he fit, swam a bomb. Yeah. <laughs> It on the wall. Yeah. Because, cool. So I guess also, I'm assuming you watched the Watchmen films. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I watched the Watchmen film back in the day. I remember actually, I had, uh, I had like the director's cut that actually incorporated, um, scenes from like, uh, the Under the Hood and Tales of the Black Freighter to try to make it more like the comics. Okay. Yeah, that, I remember hearing people had some issues with, like, the Watchmen movie because it wasn't, like, added, it wasn't adapting the story, like, one for one. And then I was just, like, I don't know. That, that'd that be a really hard story to adapt, like, one to one onto the, t like, to the movie screen. Like, there there's a lot of story set up in that. Like, I, I, I'm going to be honest. I read the first time and it didn't fully pick up on. But then when I reread it, I'm like, oh, that makes so much sense. Oh. But, like, it would have required, like, two extra hours onto that film just to make everything sort of make sense. Gotcha. If they, if they wanted to go with the original, like, alien invasion angle and not the whole Dr. Manhattan blow-up angle. Yeah, I, I think I, there's another thing. I remember someone mentioning this. Uh, I'm not sure who it was. Uh, that one of the things about print and one of the reasons why people connect print a lot better, or at least with, like, novels to movies, um, and as they always say, the book's better, uh, is because you're kind of stuck with that character uh, for significantly longer time. Um, and so if the character's good, then you're just enjoying that time, like the 12 hours you're spending with them versus the two hours. And comics kind of have the same sense of you can spend years because, you know, comics have so many issues um, with these people. Whereas in the movie, it's kind of like it's you've got two hours. Uh, I'll uh, is it, thanks for your time, Kevin. Appreciate you coming on to the show again. Uh, your your comic book expertise is very appreciated because uh, sometimes it's one of those things that you kind of just know about but don't like or you hear about but don't really know. Uh, so it's good to have someone that actually read them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So thanks, thanks, Kevin. Uh, I'm gonna throw it back to you, Steve. Thanks, Stephen, and thank you, Kevin, for coming on to the show. That's all the time we have for Hammer D20. If you yourself would like to be involved in the show in some way, shape, or form, all you gotta do is go to Cable 14's website and click Get Involved. Once you've clicked Get Involved, click Guest Appearance, and then let us know. And then type in your information, and then we'll be on your way. My producer will let me know that you've gotten in contact with Cable 14, and then I'll get in contact with you directly. You can talk about kind of anything, because nerd culture kind of entails a lot of different elements. I'm finding it's kind of anything that you kind of have a passion for some kind of thing of enjoyment or entertainment, or even, you know, as a hobby, can kind of fit in some way in nerd culture, whether you like it or not. 
Otherwise, you can contact me through my email, which is svens at hotmail.ca, which I'm going to put right there, and I'm going to make sure it's right there. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.